Hi, Chuck Sullivan coming to you again in my little backyard tea house retreat. It's a uh, beautiful day here in Southern California today. Temperature close to high 80s. And uh, I'd like to tell you about Ed Porker. I'd like to tell everybody about Ed Porker. The fact that there are so many practitioners of Kempo today who are high-ranking black belts that never met the man. It's, it's such a shame that he left us when he did. But I, I got to thinking about that and I said, if I never had the, the opportunity to meet him, I'd sure love to talk to some of the people who knew him and, and hear what they had to say about him. Hear the, the stories that, uh, that they might have concerning them and the man or just the man or, you know, a biographer could probably interview a lot of these people and get the same thing, but I think hearing it come from the people would be just a lot better. It's sort of like a true sense of, uh, of what somebody's about. So I uh, gathered up my camera equipment and I started taking it with me wherever I went that I thought there might be a couple people, especially some of the, you know, the old timers that, uh, that really knew Ed Parker. And um, I just, I asked them for their favorite Ed Parker story. Not, uh, nothing elaborate, and it could be anything. It could be something funny, it could be something poignant, it could be something sad, it could be whatever, whatever they remember about Ed that, that was meaningful to them. Now you gotta remember when I call him Ed, we were on a first name basis always, <laughs> always. That's just how it was. When I met Ed Parker, it was in February of 1959, and I was 27 years old. You know how old Ed Parker was at that time? 27 years old. Not exactly, because he had, he had turned 27 the March before that, and uh, in other words, he was getting ready to turn 28 years old the next month after I met him. Uh, I had just turned 27 years old in November, so we were both born in 1931, and it was hard for me to look upon Ed as a, uh, like a father figure. I couldn't do that. I mean, we're only eight months apart in age. Uh, he had a demeanor about him that just automatically wanted to allow you to think of him as, as a father figure, a mentor. A mentor, yes, I could, I could look at him as a mentor, but the father figure, I, I could never get that because, uh, again, we were more contemporaries than anything else. Uh, most of the people at that time were a lot younger. You got involved in karate at that time, and the pronunciation incidentally was not karate, it was karate. And we said karate until finally everybody said karate, and finally one person asked me one day when I was explaining what karate was, if there was anything like karate, and I said, oh boy, I guess we lost that battle. Uh, <laughs> the pronunciation in America is now karate. Anyway, um, Ed was, uh, he, he, he was just, he had, like I say, he had that, that demeanor about him, uh, something that I, even in, in old age I haven't acquired. <laughs> I don't feel that anybody looks upon me as a, as a father figure. Uh, anyway, be that as it may. Um, Ed was a, uh, he was a different kind of a cat. He really was. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off the stories with, with one of my own, and then uh, if, if we have time, I'll tell another one at the end. And uh, I think this particular story will give you a, a kind of an inclination of feeling as to what kind of humor the man possessed. Uh, this happened in, I have to say, around 1960, because I got started early in 59, so about mid-60, I was in it for about a year and a half. Um, looking forward to brown belt, but not there yet. And as in the advanced class, they only had three classes, beginner, intermediate, and advanced at the Pasadena School. Ed Parker taught the advanced class every time. Once in a great while, he couldn't make it, he would have somebody substitute for him, but he was the instructor. We, we had Ed Parker every class that we had, virtually, basically. Okay, so in this particular, this particular night, uh, we were, we were working out, and I think we were paired off. 
doing techniques, doing whatever we're doing, and uh, don't recall exactly what it was. But I happened to be facing forward, and my partner was facing me, so he had his back to Ed Parker. And uh, we're doing this technique, and I and I, I I'm just kind of looking around as I'm throwing punches. I'm not you know I'm not afraid of getting hit. The guy had my partner had good control, so I'm just kind of looking around, see what everybody else is doing, and I notice Ed Parker walk through the dojo and out the back to the through the dressing room. And I could see him, and I, and I thought I saw him lock the door, the back door. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of strange. So then he walked through the dojo up to the front, and I couldn't really see what he was doing, but he wasn't there long. I think he locked the front door. And I'm thinking, what's going on? I don't think anybody else saw it. I, they were probably more intent on what they were doing. But uh, all of a sudden, he walks back out, and he says, all right, line up. So we all stop what we're doing, turn around, lined up. And he said, uh, I've been hearing what some of you guys have been talking about. And he says, you're wondering. And I hear the talk. I hear it. He says, you're wondering when I'm going to teach you the secrets. And I thought, I heard the guys talking about, it. when's he going to teach us the secrets? And I remember thinking to myself, see, these were mostly kids, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. I'm 27 years old. Well, this time, I'm sorry, I'm 28 and a half. All right. So uh, I'm thinking, what secrets? There's no secrets. And then Ed Parker shocked me. <laughs> I mean, he really, he really shocked me. He says, well, gentlemen, tonight I want to teach you the secrets. And I thought, well, I'll be a son of a... There are secrets. I didn't think there was... Okay, great, there are secrets. Wow, we're going to learn the secrets. Terrific. So he said, all right, here, get a stance. And we did inward blocks. And we did outward blocks. We did outward blocks. We switched. We did inward blocks. Hour up. And we punched. And we punched. And we switched. And we punched. And we, then we moved. Maneuver back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth. Then we kicked. Then we kicked. Then we kicked. And now we're standing in a pool of our own sweat. I mean, sweat is running off us. Our geese are soaking wet. And he says, you wanted the secrets? There they are. You got them. Those are the secrets, the basics. <laughs> that was some of Ed Parker's humor. When, uh, when Ed Parker first started, he, his, his demonstrations were very good technically, but he wasn't a good public speaker. Later on, later on, and, and toward the end of his life, he was an entertainer. He wasn't just a good public speaker anymore. He was an entertainer. He loved entertaining a crowd. And he loved jokes. He loved telling jokes. He loved hearing jokes. He loved to laugh. Uh, it was a good audience. And you could tell him a joke and, and crack him up. But... Um, but he, 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 he really got good, and, uh, and I know he enjoyed it a lot. He really enjoyed, uh, he put as much entertainment into his demonstrations as he possibly could, as, as much humor, and, uh, as well as, of course, uh, the art. All right, so that's, that's, that's my story for, uh, for right now. Again, like I say, I've got, I've got dozens, literally, of things that happened when I was around Ed or we were together, uh, I, my family went over to, to his house and, and Leilani, his wife, taught my wife Florence how to make uh, beef teriyaki. And uh, we had them over and they, we went over there. I remember one time that they were over to our house and, uh, and one of his daughters, I won't mention which one just so I don't embarrass her at this, this late stage, but uh, she was just a little bitty thing and my son was just a little bitty thing and uh, and when it came time for uh, the Parkers to leave, uh, she began to cry, and her mother asked her, "What's what's what's the matter?" And, and she she wanted to take my son home. <laughs> and Leilani thought that was about the sweetest thing she ever saw. <laughs> I mean, they had a whole bunch of kids. Well, what could one more matter? You know, she she was just so tore up she couldn't take Scott home. <laughs> All right, anyway, I'm gonna. Uh, give you a whole bunch of stories about Ed Parker from the people that knew him 
and they're in no particular order, uh, no particular order of importance or subject matter or anything. They're just kind of as I got them, and I just kept compiling them until I got a whole bunch of them, and uh, here they are. I hope you enjoy them. All right, Frank, uh, of all the people that knew Ed Parker, there's only a few of us that knew him like, like we did. Yeah. And that had the kind of interrelationships with him that we did. So give me a story about you and the old man or something that uh, funny or poignant or whatever. Well, there's a, there's a, a million stories. One was... Um, we used to have this thing, we used to go out to lunch all the time, you know, and uh, he used to tell me, don't tell my wife, because she always had him on a diet or something yeah. like that, you know. And there was, uh, uh, actually, actually, I, I really learned how to eat because of him, because the only thing I ever knew was beans and rice and whatever meat scraps we had was growing up, because we were, we, were, we were a poor family. But uh, the first time we went out, uh, we were coming back. We were coming back from the West LA school. He goes, hey, you hungry? You want to eat some lunch? And I go, sure, why not? I said, okay. So we're going into this old neighborhood up by Dodger Stadium. And we get into this neighborhood. And you know, I says, hey, man, Mr. Parker, this is a bad neighborhood here, man. He goes, he goes I said, oh, don't worry about it. The, uh, I, know, I know some of the people here. He says, all right, cool. So we go into this one restaurant. It's a Filipino restaurant. And it was a little hole in the wall, a dive. And I go, and I said, hey, Mr. Parker, man, what are we doing eating in this place like this? It was a dive, you know? And he goes, I didn't really tell him that, but I was like, I was kind of just looking around. He goes, hey, they serve the best food here. So he's standing there like that, and he got a little buffet right there, and he's looking at things, just give me this, give me that, give me that. And I uh, says, uh, give me that, give me the same stuff. So I'm looking at this, I said, man, I said, I can't eat, I'm not going to eat this stuff. And so, so I just tasted a little bit, and uh, man, it was good. So I started eating it like that, then I had some noodles, and I had some fish, and then I had some, I don't know what I had, man, but... That was the first, that was the beginning of my eating ecstasy, <laughs> right in the hole in the wall. And from there, every place we went, man, it was like a, a, a total treat to go eat lunch with them. And I had found a couple of places on my own. I, I, it's a, hey, Mr. Parker, there's a place right around the corner from your house. Uh, it's called Genghis Khan. It's a, a Mongolian place where you cook at the table. Oh, man, he really loved it. <laughs> we go there and make pigs out of ourselves. The man could eat. Oh, unbelievable, <laughs> unbelievable. All day one time we were in Mexico City, and uh, they had a buffet out there, and um, he had got the typical, you know, sausage and eggs and hash browns and stuff like that, you know, uh, American breakfast. And I had, I had everything that with, with, with color in a garden that saw that, you know, uh, it, from red to green, everything in there, like that. And he was like, hey, what is that? He's looking at me and I go, I go oh, that's, this is Mexican food, Mr. Parker. You got to try it. And he goes, okay. <laughs> and he starts devouring my plate. I go, here, Mr. Parker, you can have this. I'll go get another one. <laughs> But that, that was like, you know, everywhere he went, you know, he goes, uh, uh, he, he, we always had a good time together because cause we could always eat, you know, and uh, it, it, the, the more food, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank. That was great. Well, then, oh, oh, then, then I had a friend of mine had a dream one time, and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, hey, man, I, I dreamt Mr. Parker last night. It's just, he goes... He goes, yeah, what did you dream? He goes, well, he had like a spotlight on him. And he was like, he was eating a steak. And I go, well, was he like 
trying to stuff it all in his mouth at one time, or he was cutting it up and, and trying to be polite. Says, no, man, he was devouring that thing, man. He goes, uh, and I, I, I was looking at him, and he was like, he was eating and eating, and he goes, and he said to me, he goes, uh, don't worry about the bullshit. The studio will take care of itself. You're always going to have his bullshit, but the studio is going to take care of itself. This is like after he died, yeah. you know, yeah. and then he was eating the steak and he goes, man, I miss this. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you got it right anyway. Yeah, man, that was <laughs> funny as fuck. Thank you, Frank. Okay, thank you. Okay, if you state your name and uh, tell us something that we don't know about, Ed Parker. Okay, my name's Angela Coyalo, and uh, the story I want to share with you is the very first time I met Ed Parker. Um, it was at the Internationals, and I was being introduced from a friend of mine who, one of Mr. Parker's students. And um, I went up to him, and he goes, uh, this is, I'm going to present you to Mr. Ed Parker. I said, oh, I can't wait to meet the man. It's, it's amazing. So Mr. Parker looked at me. He grabbed my hand. And he started looking at everybody else. He goes, is this the guy? Is this the guy we're talking about? And I go, yes, sir, that's him. He goes, the guy from New Mexico. He goes, yes, sir, that's it. He goes, hi, let me tell you something. Your instructor's full of shit. Hi, I'm Ed Parker. Nice to meet you. And that was my first encounter with Ed Parker way back in the day in the internationals. I just wanted to share that with you guys. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> did he ever tell you why he was full of shit? Uh, no, apparently he has a pass with my instructor. That he, did, he wasn't too fond of him at that point, and they had a, some type of a business uh, falling out. And so when he met me, he kind of, he didn't take it out on me. Uh, but then when I did go work out at the Pasadena School, this is pretty funny, um, he would sit in the office with uh, Mr. Trejo, and the big office in the Pasadena School had the big window. Right. And he sat there, and I got there, and I didn't really know the techniques for Form 4 that well yet. And so I was getting it, and I was kept getting my butt kicked. I got hit. I got hit in the face. I did fall down. I couldn't block. And these guys were just laughing at me. And I kept looking at the window, and there's Mr. Parker and Frank Trejo just rolling in laughter, just looking at me, asking me why I even bothered coming back. And so the next week, I did come back to the school, and they're looking at me going, are you crazy? Why did you come back? And they sat there, and they watched me, and I got my butt kicked again. All the black belts in the, li in the line just destroyed me. And I was just getting beat up, but I was determined to learn this stuff. And finally, according to the story Mr. Trejo told, uh, Mr. Parker said, you know what, we got to help this guy out. He goes, Frank, go, ahead, go fix it, go help him out. And that's how I got introduced to Mr. Trejo, and that's how he became my instructor also. Thank you. You're welcome. My name is Tony Martin. Uh, I first came over to uh, America in uh, 81, 82, and my purpose for coming over here was to train in Ed Parker's Kempo. Uh, I met Mr. Parker in Jersey, Channel Islands, little island just off the coast of France, uh, when I was a yellow belt and just got my orange belt. And the following day, I came over to the Santa Monica School. Uh, as years went by, I eventually moved to America and now reside here. In 1988, Mr. Parker uh, taught us at the West LA School every Thursday night. That was a two or three hour seminar class. And uh, the one thing I'll always remember about uh, Mr. Parker is that he always called me by my first name, which I thought was such an honor, you know, that he would remember my name every time he walked into the karate school. And, uh, hey, Tony, how you doing? And it, was, it was such a privilege to have that. Uh, and I always remember the classes being hard, uh, very, very tough with the likes of Brian Hawkins, Jeff Speakman, uh, Gary Miller, uh, uh, Kevin Jean in those classes. They were hard classes. Uh, but Mr. Parker, when he would demonstrate his techniques, it always looked like he was hurting you, almost killing you, but he never did. His control was fantastic, just fantastic. And I, I tell you, now that he's gone, it's a sad time that he has left us, but uh, the legacy of Ed Parker's Kempo will always live on, as long as me, uh, uh, people like Chuck Sullivan, Vic LaRue, uh, promote the art of Ed Parker's Kempo. We will never let this man's name be forgotten. I thank you. Thank you, Tony. Hello, my name is Michael Stone. Mike, uh, tell us your favorite Ed Parker story. 
Well, there's a couple of them really quick. The one was when he used to tell the jokes about uh, Jesus and Moses playing golf. That was kind of funny. And uh, the, 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 my favorite one was back in 78 when Frank Trejo was, was real young. <laughs> And uh, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning and Mr. Parker came out of the Vagabond Hotel by the pool and yelled for Frank. Frank, where are you at? Frank comes out of the room really quick, forgets where he's at, and falls right into the pool. It was hysterical. That's my favorite Ed Parker story. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. My name is Bob Mitchell. Bob, give us your favorite Ed Parker story. Well, it goes back a long time ago during the Mike Stone era when Mike Stone had the Four Seasons Karate Championships. Uh, this one year I was a brown belt. And, uh, you know, I had a pretty good year that year. I, uh, I had already won a few of the, uh, the first two seasons of Mike Stone's. And uh, it was like the third, if I remember correctly, it was about the third time uh, I was fighting in the finals. In those days, they used to have finals at night. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Parker uh, heard I was in warming up in the locker room, so he came back there and uh, he says, throw me a right-hand punch. And when he goes to throw a right-hand punch, followed with a back knuckle, do this, 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 all of a sudden, he's just working me over. And by the time I was ready to fight, I was bruised up. I mean, uh, he had such, you know, such overpowering, you know, with his power, you know, I mean, it was, uh, uh, well, I come along, you know, the next uh, four seasons, that night, you know, I, I won that night, but then later on, the next four seasons, uh, what happened was, is I'd already, I had a tough time at this next four seasons, because I used to slide in late to get my bye, to try to get the bye, and and uh, Mike Stone walked up and said, everybody gets a bye but Mitchell. If anybody would like to fight him, uh, just go ahead and uh, uh, we're going to let you fight again. So uh, sure enough, uh, Darno Garcia, you know, he didn't want to, he, he thought he would eliminate me that way first. Well, I had a real good day. I beat Darnell the first time I fought him. And then uh, everybody went through their round. I already had one more fight than everybody, and I was fighting in the finals. And who was I fighting? I was fighting Darnell Garcia. Well, uh, Mr. Parker come back into the locker room, uh, basically to give me some, uh, you know, to give me some pointers. Well, I wasn't ready for the pointers that he had to give me because I remember the last time that he beat me up before I fought Darnell the last time, and uh, it was crazy, you know. So I hid from him. I remember him. Mr. Mitchell, and uh, I've been, I'm hiding uh, in the back of the showers, and uh, I wouldn't come out because uh, I thought he was going to work me over. Uh, it ended up being a good night. Uh, I beat Darnell twice that day. I beat him in the day, and I beat him at night. You know, so it ended up being a great. But that's probably I remember that more than anything of uh, all the all the, all the time that I was with Mr. Parker. But the, the man was just uh, he didn't know his own strength. I mean, you know, his slaps would just take you down. I mean, uh, and so uh, anyway, that's my story. Thank you, Bob. That's great. Thank you very much. Joshua of St. Ives. Josh, please, tell us your favorite Ed Parker story. Um, my, my favorite story is back in 1961, just when I was just a shaved tail kid. I uh, go by this dojo in Pasadena, and I see all these guys doing all this yelling and throwing and kicking, and uh, I was just like, at, at that age, I was, uh, I was amazed at it, and I was just looking at it. So I, I went into the dojo one day, and there was a big guy there, and he was just standing there, and I went up to him. And I said, uh, hey, what, what's all this chop suey stuff? And he, he looked down on me and he, he, he what? I go, what, what's all this chop suey shit? I was young. I didn't, have, uh, didn't know what I was doing in those days. And I said the word shit. Well, uh, it was about 10 minutes later, and he showed me what it was all about. The man I was talking to was Mr. Parker. And I had no clue, of course, who he was or whatever. And after he uh, worked me over a little bit and showed me what slapping was all about, uh, I decided I wanted to be a student, and I asked him to be a, and he said, no, you, uh, no, you're not worthy. I said, okay. So I, I came by his dojo three or four times a week, and I wanted to be a student, and I asked him, and he wouldn't do it. He goes, what do you want to learn? 
this. I want to learn how to do this and kick ass and take names. This is this is good stuff. He wouldn't do it. So after almost a year of him telling me no, I learned. And I went to him one day and I said, I want to be a student. And I'd been bothering him, pestering him. I was just a, a, a pain in the butt to him. And he goes, why? So I had learned and I told him to learn self-discipline and self-defense and respect, sir. And I didn't smile when I was saying it. And he looked at me and, and he went, really? I go, yes, sir. And I said, sir. He took me in and I became a student in 1961 then. And I became a pretty good student, I, I believe. I always respected him after that. I never ever wanted to kick people's ass again. And I, I learned it from him. He's a great man and I miss him. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. My name is Jack Autry. I've uh, been around with Ed Parker for a very long time. Started in the, started in the mid-60s with Ed Parker. Uh, still active in the martial arts, but I really miss the man. But one of my favorite stories about Ed Parker, you know, the true stories are always the best ones. So this is, this is happening about, um, I'm thinking this is in uh, uh, mid-70s. And I'm an a anchor, anchor man on a black belt fighting team. And there's five guys on a fighting team. You guys all know that. And so we're, we're on an airplane. And we're flying up to Oakland. And we're going to fight five guys up there, five of the best black belts up there in that area. So I'm sitting on the airplane next to Ed Parker. And we're talking. And we're visiting. And we're carrying on. And, you know, talking. To, he, he loved the idea that I was a single guy back then. And I always would bring a young lady to the tournament. And one of the things the young lady had to do was put a big hug on Ed Parker, and he loved it. Anyway, we're talking about this on the way up there, and we finally get to the airport. The plane lands, we get out, uh, we're walking over to, the, uh, uh, to pick up our luggage, and this, uh, this uh, reporter, this female reporter comes running up to, there's five of us black belts uh, standing there, and there's Ed Parker standing there. And this, uh, this, this reporter, she says, are you Jack Autry? And I look at her and I said, yeah, I'm Jack Autry. And she says, well, I got a question for you, Jack. And I said, yeah, what's that? She says, what do you think about this full contact karate tournament you're going to fight in tonight? And I looked at Ed Parker and Ed Parker goes, oh, yeah, Jack, I forgot to tell you. This is full contact. Now, mind you, there was never any full contact tournaments back then, okay? And so I fought in the first full contact tournament ever held in the United States, not knowing about it until two hours before I'm supposed to fight. But that was Ed Parker. He said, oh, yeah, Jack, I forgot to tell you. It's full contact. And I mean, that's the, that's the kind of guy he was. And it's like, did I care? Back then, I would fight anybody, any place, any time for this guy. I mean, it's just you had to know him to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, we got a lot of stories like that. I'd love to share them with you. But the true stories, oh, by the way, you're probably wondering what happened. Uh, we did win. Uh, we won by a couple points. Uh, it was a great tournament. It was, I think it was a major fundraiser for some university up there. I forgot, a long time ago. But uh, I sure miss him. Wish he was here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. It's just a matter of tell us your favorite Ed Parker story. My favorite Ed Parker story, and it's a personal one. I'm sure I've told it to many people many times, and I'll say it again. My favorite story was that a, uh, I went to a kickboxing match uh, one evening. Uh, I think it was at the Hollywood Palladium. And, uh, of course, you know, I didn't know who was going to be there. And I come in the door, and I was greeted by this big bear of a man with the most bearish hug that I've ever had. He put his arms around me and swallowed me up. And at that point in time, I knew who Mr. Ed Parker was. And uh, that was one of the best times I've had knowing about Mr. Parker. And I got a chance to know him in that most intimate way in just a matter of moments. But I tell you, I'll never forget it because he showed so much love to me in just a moment. And I, it was just fantastic. And I didn't really believe how big the man was until that moment. He was a giant. How old were you at that time? 
I think I was, uh, sure, I'm in my 50s now. That had to be at least 25 years ago. I think I was in my early 20s at the time. Oh, you and, knew him before that? Oh, yeah, I knew him, shoot, yeah. coming up. but much younger. Yeah, again, but that was my most intimate moment. You, you see this man around at the, at the tournaments and in the studios. And again, after all that time, I had that one moment that, that stood out. You know, out of all the training times I've seen him, that was a moment for me. You know, but uh, uh, I've seen him throughout the years, and and during the time I was competing, what I had wanted to do, uh, I finally had the opportunity. I started competing uh, at 13, and uh, I think I ended up winning uh, one of the tournaments, and when I was about 24, somewhere around there, and um, what I had wanted to convey to Mr. Parker in movement was the work that my teacher and my teacher's teacher has done. And I hope that, that he was able to see that uh, uh, the time when I uh, competed for, for the championship. But, uh, and I, I didn't know if I did, but I think the, the day that he, he gave me that big bear hug, that let me know that he knew of the work. And that, that was enough for me. So that was my experience. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, sir. My name is Michael Mandeville. I'm a third degree black belt under Brian Hawkins Kempo Karate. I've um, been studying Kempo Karate as of next year for 25 years. I met Mr. Parker in 1987 and knew him uh, until um, he passed away. And uh, I was privileged to actually be working on a short film with uh, Brian Hawkins and Jeff Speakman and Chuck Sullivan and a lot of the luminaries there in Kempo and I pressed them into service on this little film. Uh, I was a white belt and a yellow belt, orange belt, somewhere right in there. And one time I went out to Mr. Parker's house. And when we went out there, uh, he had to walk into the house and you'd see the Elvis cape in this um, plastic case up on the wall on the left and stairs going straight up. And we went into the dining room on the left and there was a ukulele uh, on the wall. And uh, I, I had spoken to Jeff on the way there, Jeff Speakman, and he says, well, I don't know if you want to ask him about playing the ukulele. You don't want to do that. And uh, I was talking to Mr. Parker, and I was so intrigued by it, um, Jeff went out to get some water, and I said, Mr. Parker, can you play the ukulele for me? And he says, you know what? I wish more people asked me to do that. And he pulled it down and started playing this ukulele, and he had these hands that were about twice as big as mine, like a catcher's mitt. They were just huge. And as you know, a ukulele is about this big, a native Hawaiian instrument. And mostly it's the uh, scene in movies from drunken sailors coming off submarines or something in World War II. You don't know much about the ukulele. But he would play it with these fingers, and he could, uh, big fingers, he would play it with all these harmonics. And so when he played, it was amazing. And he really knew how to make it just a beautiful instrument. And so we finished with that, and it was very enthralling. And we talk about movies with Mr. Parker. Now, the one thing um, people, I know this all occurred over this day at his house in Pasadena. And he would talk about movies, and he knew about Ernst Lubitsch, and certainly Bla his friend Blake Edwards, but also Preston Sturgis and um, Ernst Lubitsch, the, the great filmmakers of the, uh, of the day. And he was uh, very knowledgeable, far more than most people. And that's where he and I really connected, is we talked about movies. I couldn't really talk to him much about Kempo because I was mostly just studying Kempo as, as a white, yellow, orange, purple belt. But we talked about movies, and that's where he and I connected. And then we went into his office behind the stairs, and Jeff Speakman said, uh, you know, Mr. Parker, uh, Mike Mandeville is a target shooter. And he said, um, do, you have any, uh, do you have anything you'd like to show him? Any kind of guns? Because he just target shoots and he understands weapons. And he didn't move from his desk. It was here. And there were file cabinets all around. And he didn't move. And he pulled out no less than a half a dozen weapons, half a dozen pistols, including right here there was a clock. And he opened this clock. And inside were three pistols. And he showed them to me, and a couple of them had never been fired. And he goes, yes, I don't understand it. People keep giving these things to me. And uh, 
I always remember that. I don't think he moved out of the chair, this little tiny office. Uh, so on that day, I remember I saw Mr. Parker play music, talked to him for a while about great, great movies, and uh, saw him, uh, you know, about his interest in wep all things weapons in this great little office filled with file cabinets where a million ideas must have spouted from. All his books and knowledge and everything. He's, lots of file cabinets. The whole room was filled with file cabinets. And that showed me Mr. Parker was a man who loved America and American movies. He loved music. He had an amazing laugh despite this fierce, fierce look. And he was a man of ideas. And that was Mr. Parker to me. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my favorite Ed Parker story. Uh, I'm Guru Joe DeCalsa, fifth degree black under Brian Hawkins. And I first met Mr. Parker in 1980, uh, and I went through some personal changes in my life. Uh, I went through a divorce in 1983, a loss of my business, but I still kept up with my Kempo and saw him periodically as I would come into the, the beginner class, and he would be coming in on Thursday night for the advanced class. But it wasn't until uh, 1987 that I actually got my brown belt. And once you got your brown belt, you were qualified to study with Mr. Parker in his advanced class on Thursday night. So I remember my first advanced class, Mr. Parker was teaching long form seven, which is the club form. So we all had sticks and all of us new brown belts were in the corner hitting ourselves in the head and messing up the form. And I saw Mr. Parker walking a diagonal line from the front of the dojo back toward the brown belts. And I thought to myself, you know what? He's going to come and take back my brown belt. I'm just not qualified. And he came and he stood in front of me and said, you know what? It's been a long road, but you finally made it. And then he gave me a big hug. And so that just demonstrated to me that even though he had hundreds of students, maybe thousands of students, Mr. Parker really knew where everyone was and, and, and what everyone was doing. So uh, that's my favorite Ed Parker story. My name is Rick Walker, and I am the son of Johnny Walker, who uh, actually was, is a part of the family tree um, under Mr. Chuck Sullivan and Ed Parker. And part of the honor of being here today is actually having Chuck Sullivan, who is running this camera right now, and the great stories and the great backgrounds that they shared. So, so my, I osmosed into this world. My father has since passed, but was very, very close with Mr. Parker. And I think that they had kind of a different relationship than a lot of people. Um, I think there was a tremendous respect for both, both of them. Uh, my dad was a pretty tough guy. Um, Mr. Parker obviously was a very tough guy, but they respected each other, interestingly enough. And it was never Mr. Parker, it was Ed. It was a different time then. And, uh, and I think that, that the camaraderie then, which was very different than it is today, was very respectful. Um, I think that that the relationship that Mr. Parker had with, with, with my father um, was very, very different because I think there was a different kind of respect level. My dad used to shoot films for Mr. Parker, but I was very fortunate to be involved in that, and, and I wish my father were still around because he has incredibly great stories. But, but I do certainly remember being in Mr. Parker's house um, with my father. And, and Mr. Parker talking about weapons that he liked. Like he'd reach into the drawer and he'd grab a handful of car keys and he'd stick those car keys in the fingers and he says, oh, I just love great weapons these car keys are. You know, you can pick them up, you can toss them at somebody, or you can hold them in your hands. You can do. And the other thing is uh, talking about fighting in a phone booth. You know, and he would have these conversations with my dad that he didn't necessarily have with a lot of people because they were both very tough people and knew how to fight, just like Chuck, just like a lot of the old time guys. And I remember one time when I was in the, the Pasadena school and um, I had said something to Mr. Parker about something not working. Well, that obviously at my age, I was very young, and it was probably not even the smartest thing to do because he didn't care if I was big or small or tall, he was gonna show me that it worked. So, and it was a technique where the guy throws a right hand in, and you parry and you rake across the rib cage. And I always thought that, that was just a glancing blow. That's nothing. And he, so I made the mistake of, of saying I didn't think it worked. And, and I had bruised ribs for a very long period of time after that. 
But those kinds of stories, little things, anecdotes that I was able to just, mostly I was able to watch what I would consider to be the original Ed Parker, which was very old school, very tough, very strong, very quick. And I think it was a very different time that, that I was able to witness part of through my father that it wasn't about business. It was really about the martial arts and what worked. And, and I think there are many people in the system today that have helped continue that. And then also there's people in the system that have kind of spread it off into other things. But at least for me personally, I'm honored, I touched my radio mic, but I'm honored to, to have been able to spend time with Mr. Parker. He used to come to our classes when we used to teach privately and he would do promotions and things for us. And we were very fortunate to have kind of a one-on-one -on -one experience with him. I guess the best thing is that I'm honored to be a part of this great big family and, uh, and to be a kind of grandfathered in because of my father's relationship with it. So, um, you know, I hope it adds a little bit of history to it. And thank you very much. My name is Wes Idol III and I started training in 1987, was that 1986? 1986. I started with Albert Cornejo across the street from the West LA school. And shortly after training a few months, I found out about the Parker School across the street. And I was told by Mr. Cornejo I could go over there. And so I went over there and I met Brian Hawkins. So this is later, it was about 87. He started, he was the manager of the school. And he said, you could watch one advanced class. And I lucked out. The one night I chose, a Thursday night, Ed Parker was teaching. And I saw this man come out and he seemed heavy set not very um, <laughs> cardiovascularly fit in my eyes, but still I knew who he was. <clears throat> and then I saw him move, and I don't think I even understood how much of what was happening when it was happening, because I'd only been training maybe six months. But still it got my attention. He seemed very fast. He seemed very heavy and quick, if that makes any sense. And at the end of it, I remember he came over. I was one of the only people in the stands because it was a Thursday night, which is a closed class. And he asked me who I was, and I said, oh, my name is, my name is Wes Idol, and I'm a student of Albert Cornejo's. He then extended his arms all the way out to shake my hand. And I, I, I stood up quickly and bowed. And, and I remember feeling like that idea of, suspect before prospect, that happened in half of a second when I mentioned Albert Conejo's name. And it was like I had the buzzword, you know, the, the, the word that gets you in the club. And I told this story to Howard Silva, who knew Mr. Parker very well. And he said, how did he shake your hands? And I said, he extended his arms all the way out. And Howard Silva said, what did you tell him? And I said, oh, I said I was Albert Conejo's student. Silva just shook his head side to side and thought, God damn, Albert. The old man loved him so much. I've never seen Ed Parker ever extend his arms like this to shake anybody's hand, but you said Albert Cornejo, and that's what did it. Because there's always anchored elbows. That's what I was told. Um, and then I remember seeing Ed Parker at uh, the Internationals, and I'm sitting next to Albert Cornejo. And I remember that same pleasantness, except there was an issue on stage. There was a black belt that shouldn't be there. And I saw Ed Parker take him off the stage, walk him out, walk over to another unnamed senior black belt, which I won't mention any names. This individual was talking a lot. And, and then when Parker came up with his would-be student, he uh, got very uh, subservient and obsequious and and said, oh, Mr. Parker, Mr. Parker, Mr. Parker. And he was jabbering on a lot before Mr. Parker showed up. And I could, I'd never seen Mr. Parker angry. I just kind of met the man. And then he was all gruff and all gruff. And he looked over and he goes, oh, Alberto, how you doing? 
I'm okay, Mr. Parker. How are you? I'm good. And again, he just kind of flipped and switched. And I saw, uh, he was definitely angry when he walked up with this black belt that shouldn't have been on stage. But to see again him switch so quickly when he saw Albert Corneo, and he's very warm to me as well, sitting next to him, I could tell that I was in good company when I was with Albert Cornejo in regard to Mr. Parker. That's for sure. That's about it. My name is Bry Cooper. I uh, originally met Mr. Parker for the first time in 1985 in Jersey Channel Islands where I was studying American Kempo with the, uh, Roy McDonald. At the time I was a... Uh, Yellow belt, I think. Yellow belt, orange belt. And uh, so Mr. Parker had come over with Skip Hancock and uh, uh, Lee Wedlake at Dennis Canasta. And uh, at the end of the week, we had a big get-together at the ho at a hotel on the island. And I always remember one story I always remember. Is, uh, we came in and sat down, and Mr. Parker was already sitting there. And, of course, you know, we, we were very sort of... A, it was Mr. Parker, and we idolized Mr. Parker. And uh, there was one Scottish kid who had just started training with us, a little kid with a, with a beard. We had this full beard that was only a young guy, though, 20, 21 years old. And he came in, and uh, everybody was sort of tense because we didn't know what to say. And, you know, it was Mr. Mr. Parker was sitting there. And this kid gets up, and uh, he walks over to him, and plonked himself right next to Mr. Parker, and he goes, Hey, Eddie, I've got one for you. And, and he start, and of course we all went, oh, and then he starts to tell him this joke, and it was so, it was a funny joke, and then Mr. Parker goes, ah, ha, I've got one for you, and then it just sort of broke the ice, and it was the first time I saw that this guy's like not only our master in, you know, of our system, but a really genuine, honest man that would had affinity for the students, not just was out there just teaching. He had this great affinity for those who had, would have affinity for him. When I came here in 1988, I lived in the Parker Studios in West LA. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was this kid. I was a young kid, too. I didn't, I didn't have anything. All I was there, I was living on the floor. I'd open the studio at 10 in the morning. I would close it and wake up by 10 at night. But he, he would always treat, every time he saw me, he would be at the advanced classes. Everybody had to leave below the rank of brown belt. And at the time, I was a green belt. I tested for my brown under Mr. Parker. And he would always, he would put his arm around me and he'd say, he'd say no, I want you to stay, I want you to stay. And, and you sit there and there was an old couch in the studio at the time and I would sit on the couch with my notebook and my pen and making notes. And you know what, I know he really, really appreciated that. One thing I asked him in Jersey was, it was I asked him a question once and he, and he said to me, read the books, Infinite Insights. And I did and I read those books and I'd had them for a while. But because he, he, he told me to read the books and I read these books from front to, to literally from front to back over and over again and interesting enough when you do that i kind of you again you see the affinity he had for this art and for the people who were learning this art from him and that's one thing that i really really i don't know, impinged on me when i when i got here as a young man it wasn't i've been around fortunately a lot of masters in the years and i started in shotokan karate in great britain when i was around a lot of top guys and it was a different sort of it was a hierarchy and it was very sort of regimented and, and it lacked that sort of connection that, 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 that he had for people and it was very uh, uh, addictive, you know, you got it, not, not, that's not the word I should say, it was very, uh, well, it was contagious is what it was, it was very contagious and uh, yeah, that's, uh, he was a great man, I was very sad. I te and one last thing, I don't know if you can edit it, if you want to keep this in. When I tested for my brown belt under Mr. Parker, I had tears running down my cheeks because that's what I wanted. I wanted to test for my brown belt under Mr. Parker. And it wasn't about the black. It was just to get in that black gi so that I could be in his, although he'd let me sit in, in those classes and be around, be around the man. Uh, yeah, good memories. Uh, yeah. My name's Lou Voiler. Uh, I studied Kempo Karate, got my black belt under Jeff Speakman, and that's how I met Mr. Parker, was uh, on the set of Perfect Weapon. He was the Kempo technical advisor on it, and that made me Mr. Parker's waiter. I used to bring him lobster from 
uh, the catering truck every night and, and feed him, and I was the guy he'd pound on whenever somebody wanted to see what Kempo looked like. And uh, at that early stage in my Kempo career, I was pretty lucky because I was surrounded by legends at that point, and this this man took the time to you know make me feel like I was somebody and I was a pup. And uh, the last time I saw Ed Parker was a seminar that he was doing at the, the West LA studio. And it was, he was teaching Thundering Hammers and he, he pounded on me and then wanted me to do the same thing to him. And I just felt, how do you pound on a living legend? How do you, it's like, I got, uh, I, I was like walking on eggshells. I was like, ah, uh, I think I'd rather not. Um, again, I don't even know that I belong on this tape. I, there's so many legends that had, you know, such wonderful relationships with this guy. I just, Mr. Parker made everybody he came into contact with feel important. I was a pup at that point, and it, it, it was just made me feel like I was part of his Kempo family. That's what it was about. Thank you. There's always one very favorite story with Mr. Parker. I come into the house for a lesson one day and Mr. Parker tells me, we're gonna work on knife techniques and he pulls the knife out and he holds it up in the air. And I'm thinking, I don't want to. <laughs> and he puts the knife on the table and he holds up the scabbard and I'm going, I, I can do this. And then he puts blue chalk on both sides. I'm like, I can do this. And then he hands it to me. And he says, stab me. I can do this. I attack him. And he, whoop, and he took it away from me. And he's attacking me. And I'm blocking and I'm parrying. And I think I'm doing good because he never stabbed me. And he stops and he goes, how do you think you did? I said, I think I did good. He says, go look at yourself in the mirror. I looked in the mirror and I had a blue streak here, 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 here. And here. And I went, <sighs> and he goes, I think maybe this is enough today, Rich Hale. What do you think? And I went, <sighs> <laughs> so my lesson was less than two minutes for the greatest lesson I ever had. It's <laughs> great. My name is Gabriel Fabella, and I had private instruction with Mr. Parker. And I think one of the important lessons that I had was when, uh, on my very first lesson, I had heard from other people that uh, never ask them that that you want to learn like long form seven or long form eight, because he'll just at, tell you, "Let's start with short form one," and then he would make you go through short form one. He says, "How can I teach you?" long form eight when you don't know short form one. <laughs> and, that, and, and that made me just become a beginner. And so uh, with that lesson, walking into the first private lesson I had with him, uh, he said, where do you want to start? So I was already kind of prepared. And I said, well, how about if we start, start with short form one <laughs> and the basics? And he said, good choice. And uh, the lessons with the, the block set back then when it was known as the star block and the short form, uh, short form one was uh, the, uh, not to look at it from the outside but from the inside as well. And <clears throat> his lessons were always in the living room of his house. So I remember looking at a flower and he said, describe that flower to me. I said, oh, well, it's uh, yellow, green, it's got leaves, petals. He said, that's it? And I said, that's it. And he goes, well, how about from the inside to the, and looking at it from the inside to the outside. And I said, okay, so I started to describe the flower, looking at it from the inside out, and, and he said, okay, and so now let's look at short form one and star block or block set one and, and look at it from the outside and then let's start exploring it from the inside out. And that's where he really started to, I started to see things from both inside and out. And, and it was a very, very wonderful lesson because it's, the lesson that's always stuck to me all these years and uh, and so it was very valuable.
So that was, that was very personal to me. My name is Albert Cornejo. All right, Albert, tell us your favorite Ed Parker story. Well, number one, I used to cut Ed's, Ed's hair all the way up to the day that he passed away. One day I trapped Ed because I found out he played the ukulele. And I said, hey, Ed, if you ever want a haircut again, you bring your ukulele in so I can hear you play. Oh, okay, Cornejo. He drove up one day and I jumped out of the barber shop. You bring your ukulele? Oh, no, then I ain't giving you a haircut. I said, I'm not going to cut your hair till you bring your ukulele. And that guy had some kind of a look on him like this. I said, okay, this time, but next time you're not getting a haircut. <laughs> he had that kind of look, you know, that you just figure you bring him in. I don't know why, again, he brought his ukulele in. There were 10, 20 guys in the shop, and the camera was going. I set up my own camera, and he was playing all kinds of stuff. So I brought out my harmonica and was going to play some music. And he didn't want to do it. And he put it was, hey, come on, hey, what's wrong with you? You think you're the only star in this place? It's my shop. <laughs> Everybody looked and wondered why I'm talking to the old man like that. <laughs> come on, Ed, come on. And he started packing it away. That's all right, all right, I won't play the harmonica. So he took it out and played a Mexican song for me. <laughs> then it stopped and I started giving him a haircut. But the last haircut I gave him was the day that he was going to Hawaii. And he was getting pretty big, Mr. Parker. And uh, he was sitting in the chair, and I said, Eddie boy, but I put my hand on his belly. And I said, man, you eating too much poi, buddy. I said, you better watch yourself. You're going to get a heart attack and die one day. And when you come back from Hawaii, I want to take privates from you. He says, oh, OK, Conejo. And I was so happy. They woke me up about 2 in the morning, some crazy time. I can't remember times and dates. I found out that he had a heart attack and passed away. That was the saddest day in my life. I mean, uh, everybody just uh, was mesmerized with such a great man. If it wasn't for him, I'd have probably been doing crime right now. He helped me just to get myself straight. All right, we're down here in Florida and uh, getting ready for our seminar. But I figured while we're here, why well, we'd grab a couple of uh, a couple of Ed Porker stories and uh, Vic and I came down. So rather than doing it at home, we'll do it here. Tell us, Vic, tell us all about uh, my favorite Ed Porker story. Your favorite Ed Porker story. Well, I've got a couple, a few of them, but uh, I love Mr. Parker. He was an awful lot of fun. And he really liked to um, live his life off other people's experiences. He'd tell, tell me another story, tell me another story. So I was managing the uh, Santa Monica Ed Parker School for Mr. Parker, and he told me that he was going to do a Billy Idol concert. And he had promised me that I could do that within one day. And uh, he needed a couple other bouncers. So me and a buddy of mine rode our Harleys down there, and we parked him out in front of the school, and we went in, and Mr. Parker showed up. And um, he'd already done the concert, so we didn't get to go do the bodyguard with him. So, but anyway, we were kidding around, and our Harleys were parked right out in front. And he said, I said to him, hey, Mr. Parker, would you like to go for a ride? Now, I'd already heard the story about Elvis taking the governor off his golf cart and challenging Mr. Parker, let me take you for a ride in the golf course, golf cart. And uh, naturally, uh, Ed would say, and it was fast. The thing was really fast. And they were screaming in that golf cart. And Ed said, can't you get it to go any faster? You know, he was like that. He So I, I kind of prodded him a little bit. Hey, you going to go for a ride with me? He goes, well, uh, okay. Now, my bike was a rigid frame suicide shift. That means hand shift, foot clutch. I'm running a great big radial tire on the back with a little short sissy bar. And it comes straight up real easy by myself. So I get Mr. Parker on the back, which means it just go right over backwards real easy. Clutch it and it's gone. So... I took him for a ride around the block. If you turn left there on that street, it's pretty much an industrial street, so I had to be careful. Last thing I wanted to do was run into something with Mr. Parker on the back. But I went down the street, and as I rolled out, I hit second gear. I brought it up into a wheel stand, and I wheel stand it all the way down the street, put it down, and I flipped a quick U-turn, and I went back. And I said, hey, did you like that? And he goes, wow, I love that. And we were, you know, we made it, so he loved it. He's like, I said, you want to do it again? He said, uh, yeah, and I gave him a choice. I, I was gone and I did it again. When I come back and I parked the bike, he got off and he said, 
black belt, motorcycle rider, <laughs> promoted me to black belt on my motorcycle. But uh, that was one of the, that's my favorite story with Mr. Parker, and um, I had a lot of really wonderful experiences with him. What level were you at the time? What level? Yeah, what? Well, I was managing the Santa Monica School. I was a second degree for three years in rank at that time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but he made you a motorcycle black belt too. Oh, he had nothing to do with Mark. Yeah, right. he just got <laughs> off it. Happy to get off it. Yeah. Because I just scared the hell out of him. Yeah. And uh, you could tell that I had it under control. And Lord knows I didn't want to hurt my bike or myself. And I certainly didn't want to be responsible for being the one that dragged Mr. Parker down the street on the back of my Harley. <laughs> <laughs> he got caught in the spokes or something, you know. But uh, at 250 pounds, he was a big boy in the back. Now, yep. I had Steve Sanders in the back of my bike, too. And Steve Sanders said, you do a wheel stand, and he stuck his thumbs out, and he, instead of holding me, he stuck his thumbs in here. He said, I won't give it to you, Oops. If, if you if you wheel stand on that. Well, I've had a few people on that Harley. Chuck's, got, Chuck's smarter than Never that. got me on that Harley. Say, Chuck's smarter than that. But you did take a ride in my 57 Nomad. Short. Short. I turned the corner, got on it. Chuck said, stop the car. And I said, why? He said, I went out. I go, oh, that's good. But no, I'm going home. And I took him around the corner and brought him back. Thank you. My pleasure. Mr. Kelly, you you knew Ed Parker, as we all did. Tell us tell us something about him. Tell us something that either happened with you or that you heard of or that you know, something personal that, that I think uh we all have our stories, and there's actually many of them, but there's one particular one that I actually have told over the years to a few people. I think even it was put into one of the, one of the Kempo books that were written by one of the seniors. But it was in regards to when he was doing one of his seminars. We picked him up in Baltimore. I was from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And so uh, I was with, at that time, Mr. Francisco Condi. People know him because he was referenced in the Nunchuck book. He was one who created the Kunchucka. And that's how I met Ed Parker. I was about 17 years old at that time. That was my first experience, was meeting him when he came on the East Coast. And a lot of people uh, didn't know his travels on one coast to the next coast, or even sometimes even out of seas, you know, over, or overseas. But um, the point of the matter is, I remember one particular time he came to a location. It was, it was at a shopping center. Matter of fact, it's still there. It's called Park City. It's in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And on the bottom of the plaza of this mall, it was an open area back then, when I was there in the 70s. And we would use a particular area of about six to 8,000 square feet, almost 10, I should say, because it, was under, it wasn't even developed yet. And that's where we held our tournaments every month. Mm. And Ed Parker was coming into the East Coast, and we drove down from Lancaster uh, to Baltimore and actually picked him up at Joe Palanzo School, and we drove him, drove him back up to Lancaster. So, of course, he stayed for the night. And then the next day, it was an open seminar, because he used to have open seminars. Mr. Conde had an organization of his own called the Oriental Defensive Arts Association, ODA, which was formed in 66. And uh, he was one of those guys on the East Coast who kind of broke a lot of the racial tension. And uh, he had a great following with some of the guys out of Baltimore, Virginia, Delaware, and so forth. And uh, he had a particular seminar with Ed Parker being the guest. So me and this other gentleman, like, you know, Ed Parker needed bodyguards or <laughs> escort <laughs> service. We were made to dress up in our suit. I drove his Cadillac because that Mr. Parker, or excuse me, Mr. Condi had a, uh, we had the school off of North Charlotte Street. We had two used car lots that we, had, we actually had three businesses and then a trophy shop. So I was running like all four of his businesses then. And we had a, an open seminar with pretty much anybody and everybody that he can gather up. Kali Griffin came down from Massachusetts, uh, Gary Rodimus came out of York, Pennsylvania, and all these other people came from really different systems. I mean, little bit Gojiru or Taekwondo, Shorinru, the Kempo people would come, uh, some of the Muda Kwan guys, Dr. Jose Jones from the Wheel Kickers, which was from the Junri group out of the, uh, I guess that was the D.C. area. So they would come, and Ed Park was one of the best that I ever saw teach a universal seminar where everyone in attendance could grasp his way of teaching. He had the antidotes, the analogies, and circumstances where he made everyone feel comfortable. And he would always say, try this. If you like it, use it. If you didn't like it, discard it. But what we're going to do today is called the rearrangement concept. And that's when he would do his block, strike, 
elbow sandwich to the groin, and you call that, you know, a count of four moves, one, two, three, four. And he was basically saying, well, during your first move to your second move, I would try to do my sandwiching elbow, but during the interruption from second to third, the guy puts his hand out and there's a possibility that he could check you off. What would you do? He said, well, we can go from one, two, four, back to three. Hence, rearrange the order. So what we had was that typical audience of black belts, and there was always that one or two in the audience that it's the black belt who's doing a seminar during a seminar. And he was talking about the rearrangement concept and told him pretty much, go ahead, break, and you know, work with it. And I was sitting there next to the little stage that was to my right, Avon was to my, uh, f he was to the far corner. We were strategically put up to just kind of watch and see who was, you know, behaving, if you will. And if they weren't, we would show them, you know, where the door was located. So we had to keep our eye on Mr. Condi and he would give us a nod or turn his head like this. But Mr. Parker was saying, okay, and bop, 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 doing his thing. He'd call it three count, one, two, three, one. He was doing this beat. So he said, okay, everybody break, go play with it. So I'm watching the audience and there was this one guy, I don't even know where he came from, but he was that doubting Thomas. So he's going around talking amongst the crowd and saying, oh, that crap don't work, I mean, that's not it. And, he, and you know, Mr. Parker never really moved his head, it's those eyes, he always had those eyes and he, he was tuned in and ready to rock and roll at all times. So he says, okay, line up. <clears throat> And uh, he was exactly like where this pillow is. I mean, that's how close him and I were. And I just stood my place, you know, all my suit stuff and did what I was told. And he said, okay, line up. Does anybody have any questions? And Ed Parker, if there's one thing I recall is he en enjoyed questions. He enjoyed those doubting Thomases. And what he was talking about was going from one to two to three to four. And at any time, you can go from one to two to four to three, one to four to three to two, and just show that rearrangement. And he asked anybody had any questions. And as he was going through the process, this guy raises his hand. He says, well, I don't think it would work. And I <laughs> looked over at Mr. Condi, and Condi looked at me like, oh, what? I can't believe this guy said that. And Mr. Parker instantly like, put his hand on me because he knew I was ready to step up. He goes, I he goes and, this, and I never heard him swear. But it was like maybe the moment, and he said, bullshit, grab me. And what the move was is if someone grabbed you, he gave you the ideal position, place your arm on the inside of the elbow, go to the neck, crash at the elbow, boom, down to the groin. And he said, bullshit, you could grab me. And I'll tell you, it was the fastest situation of movement. I thought I was in a room of lightning because he would echo a room like thunder. And so help me, as I blinked, I heard crack, and all I saw was two fingers. And what he did is he hit this guy with two fingers on this meridian, and all I saw was two fingers and a flurry, and he was done. Not only was he done, but I, I mean, I tell you, I blinked and I missed something. And as I looked and I heard the, like lightning, I literally saw on this guy's form, because I witnessed it, a hematoma just went. <sighs> he perfectly channeled his strike with a two finger chop on this guy's arm, hit neck, elbow, groin so fast that he was done, and I watched this thing go. <sighs> and the guy is like, oh my God. And everybody just stopped. And he, he chuckled and he said, oh, do we have a believer? Can someone please help this young man and get him some ice to tend to his wound? And where were we, he said. <laughs> and it was just to me, at that point in time, I'm like, now that's some excitement. Because he went from zero to 100 that quick. And being 17, you know, I'm a young teenager, learning about who this person is. And I was a big Elvis fan, so I always knew who Ed Parker was. But to watch it and watch him go from nonchalant to an exciting explosion of energy. And I don't mean just a little tap. I mean, he rocked the house. I think that would rock, boom, done. And then not only was he done, and I, I know I blinked, but it was done, and then I looked at the wound, and I saw it formulate to the point where his 
black and blue, and it never broke skin. Almost like he calculated it. <laughs> That's my Ed Parker story, and I'm sticking to it, because it was amazing. <laughs> I'm 51 now, and I remember it like it was yesterday. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Here's a man that traveled extensively with Mr. Parker back in the day in Europe. And uh, tell us, give us your favorite story about Ed Parker, Rainer. Uh, there are so many favorite stories. One in particular was uh, when we were driving from Frankfurt, Germany to Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, I was driving a BMW, the 8 Series. It's a fast car. And we were on the Autobahn and doing about, uh, oh, I would say about 90, 95 miles an hour, and Mr. Parker was sitting up all tense, looking. And by the time I was doing 140, he was sound asleep. And then I woke him up when we came to the board. I said, Mr. Parker, we are now in Switzerland. Oh, did I sleep? Uh, yes, I had a good sleep. <laughs> and, All right, well, we're still here in Florida, so uh, got a little time. Carl, tell us a story. Okay, my favorite story with Mr. Parker, or Ed, as we used to always call him. Uh, I was doing, I was in the uh, old uh, Inglewood School, and he came by one day when we were standing around. It was in between classes. There was nobody there in the afternoon, and he did a habit of doing that, showing up every now and then, just showed up. And so I was out doing a staff set on the mat. So he says, well, let's walk through the staff set. Well, we walked through the staff set, and then when we were finished with that, he says, do you know how to get faster? And I says, no, I have no idea how to get faster like you are. I said, I have no clue whatsoever. At that time, I was actually a black belt. But he says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the three steps, the simplified steps of what he called the Zen. And so we, sat, we got down on the mats, on our knees, facing each other, and he began with step one. Step one was, how do you get from here to there? First, you have to think it. That thought has to register with your nerves and move to your hand. That's step one. So there's a three-step process in there. The second one was, you think and your hand moves. So now you thought and your hand moved both at the same time. So that reduces it to two, and it's faster. The third time, Mr. Parker decided, okay, now, here we go for step three, and he reached out and nailed me right, right in the shoulder as he would reach out and touch with each of the steps, and I about went over backwards, and then I asked him, how did you do that? He says, step three is, your thought, you move, your actual movement is before your thought. It becomes a flash in your head. So I equate it these days for the newer generation we take step one, it's a photograph of something. Step two, it's running a DVD fast forward or any movie that you've got in a fast forward. The third step is just seeing flashes in your mind, but you see the entire movement as a flash. And that's what I contribute today to not only Mr. Sullivan's great teaching, but also Ed's helping me get faster and faster through the years. And that's my favorite story from him. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Right, we're here with Stacy Picasha, and uh, Stacy, I'm going to ask you the same as I've asked everybody else. Tell us your favorite Ed Porker story, something that, that you remember about Ed that you personally were there for. Uh, when I first started, I was fortunate enough to have both Ed Parker and Chuck Sullivan as my instructors. And there were a number of us that started kind of together, so we're all novice white belts. And we would watch uh, Mr. Parker. And when he would do almost every one of his techniques or move in any way, we watched the way his fist was configured. His little finger was always up like that. And in remembering in those days, you had to have your fist and your wrist and your forearm straight as a rod. 
But we'd always see this fist out and we kept thinking to ourselves, what is that? Is it a secret technique? Is it an eye gouge? Is he ever going to tell us what it is? And I mean, this went on for months and months and months. And finally, I guess the uh, anticipation of trying to figure this thing out got too much for us. So we finally approached Chuck because we could approach Chuck. We weren't going to approach Mr. Parker and ask him what that was because he probably wasn't ready to tell us the big secret. And Chuck looked at us and said, well, when he was a kid, he broke his finger and now he can't close his hand into a fist. And we just went, what? We All this anticipation and he had a broken finger. That's what I remember most about uh, the beginning days beside all the sweat and the tears and stuff that we went through working out. Thank you. That's great. This gentleman is uh, Mr. Steve Mohammed. Would you, Steve, would you give us your, your full name and title these days? My name is Steve Mohammed. Uh, I've been given the rank of Sijo, which means founder or creator in the martial science. All right, but you were a, uh, a member of our school on Crenshaw Boulevard back in the, in the early 60s. And as, a, as I recall, you were still in the Marine Corps yes. when, you, when you came to us. I didn't know that. I knew you had been a Marine. I thought you had been, but you were a former one. No, you're still active. Anyway, um, tell us, uh, you know, something that happened between or concerning Mr. Parker in those days. I believe that we were at the International one year, and Gregory Master Parker was going to put on a demonstration. And I was standing with Vic, which was probably around 18, 19 years old at that time. But he knew a little bit more about Parker putting on demonstrations than what I did. But uh, Gregory Master Parker asked for volunteers. So I stuck my hand up, Vic pulled my hand down, said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I'm looking at Vic, what, what is wrong with this guy, you know? And I stood there and I began to watch uh, Gregory Master Parker go through these techniques. And when it came to the second and the last person, he beat them down to the ground. I looked over at Vic. <laughs> Thank you. I said, now I understand what you meant. I never volunteered again after that and never wanted to volunteer. I thank you for that, Dick. <laughs> thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Are you sure it's working now? It's working now. And your name is? My name is Dave Hebler, and I am Dave Hebler, the real guy. Uh, you were asking about an uh, Ed, Ed Parker story. I, I'll tell you one you, you, you might remember. I don't remember what year it was at the Internationals, but early on. And Ed was uh, doing a, um, a mass attack. And I'm one of the guys that was in that attack. Now, I'm not stupid and I learned real early on that when you're in a mass attack with Ed Parker, you be the first guy. Because about the time he got to guy number five or guy number six, his control is a little bit less than uh, desirable, let me put it that way. The other thing I learned is that when he knocked you down, stay down. Because he would come around and check you out. You know afterwards so the technique he's performing on me is leap of death the first part of it somewhere I have a picture I don't know where it is I lost it it shows me in midair horizontal throwing me through the air and as I hit the hit the stage I kind of skidded a little bit and you remember how um, all of the front row people were right there. I mean, they were right in front of me, just you know, a foot or two away from the edge of the stage. And I skidded right up to this girl. And she was like, who, like this, you know, as I come up. And, I, and she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah. I said, is he still there? <laughs> and she went, Yes, he is. And I went, 
tell me when he leaves. <laughs> she said, okay. And she's looking some more. And she said, okay, he's left now. So I kissed her on the forehead and jumped, <laughs> jumped back up. But that was, uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know whether it was funny at the time, but it's kind of funny now, <laughs> since I survived it. So, one Ed Parker story, anyhow. I'll tell one where you were there. Okay, I think you'll remember this. We did a TV show. Me and you, Chuck Sullivan, and Sterling Peacock, and Ed Parker. Do you remember the, uh, the guy's name, the, the MC, um, what show it was? Or? Rough Story. Rough Story, okay. Rough Story. Yeah. Anyhow, Sterling Peacock is all nervous about being on television and doing this technique. And you remember that shoulder grab technique of scooping on around and come over and rip around? Well, that's what he did on me. He got all excited. Ripped me around and smashed his knee into my face and knocked me out right then and there. And I hit the ground. I wasn't really knocked out, but I was stunned. And Ralph Story was like shocked. You know, he went, are you okay? Is he okay? You know, I mean, because he was really concerned that I was hurt. And Ed Parker, bless his heart, said, ah, he's fine. <laughs> He'll be all right. <laughs> he's, he's all right. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> He'll was, stop bleeding in a while. <laughs> who was the guy that gave you his tie? Uh, Maury... Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam. Maury Amsterdam. Yes. Yep. Maury, I remember him. You, you admired that, that his That chicken tie. Yeah. yeah it had it, chickens on it. He admired it, and he took it off, and he gave it to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah chickens on it. Maury Amsterdam. <laughs> Maury Amsterdam, right. Yeah. Do you remember uh, the what happened in the early part? We only had about, we had like, I think, two minutes. And for a minute and a half, Ralph Story was trying to get the pronunciation of Karate. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember, and he couldn't do it. No. <laughs> and finally, it was like, uh, can we do something here? And, and you got to do, I think, I think Sterling got to do something, I got to do something, and all you got to do is get beat up. Yep, that's yep, right. Yep. You guys, I've never forgiven you guys, by the way. <laughs> well, we, we thank you once again, Dave. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>
and we're ready, and he's going to kick George first. So first he came up to us and gave us the famous question, do you want a kick or do you want heel of palm? Well, everybody knew not to take Mr. Parker's heel of palm because it always wound up in the solar plexus. So we took the kick. Well, we get down on our horses and we're waiting and he's going to kick George first, like I say. And George starts to back up as soon as he sees the kick. And Mr. Parker's kick comes up, hits him in the chest, and takes him all the way back to the wall. Comes back, sits down, comes over to me next. And I'm sitting there, oh, God, I'm going to get nailed. I got my hands on the side and I'm watching Mr. Parker. And as he kicks, as soon as I felt the kick, I rolled back on my heels. I took two steps back, walked up, got back in horse position. Mr. Dimmick looks over at Mr. Parker and he says, what do you think? He kind of rolled back with that. You think we should kick him again? And I'm sitting there saying, oh no, not again. And Ed, that, this is what I really remember the most. He got this big smile on his face and he said, you know something, if he's smart enough to go with it, let's let him go. And they just broke up laughing. And we all went out to dinner that night and had a great time. And that's, that was one of my best memories of Mr. Parker. We had a lot of years together. Just something I got to throw in is that I remember when I fought in my first internationals, which was 1967. I fought in my last internationals in 1997, 30 years later in the over 50 category. And Ed came up to me then, and I had already been retired from fighting for five years. And he came up, you know something? And he... He did use this word, you're the only schmuck I know that could come out from five years of not fighting in my tournament and walk out with a trophy. And that kind of made my day. So those are my memories of Mr. P and uh, they'll always stick in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Here we are with Tom Bleeker and uh, whom I have known forever and a day. <laughs> and uh, you got to have some good, some good stuff about it. <laughs> yeah, I've got a handful of them. And um, one of them that, uh, that I just love, it, it happened in the late 80s, uh, right before the tribute. And um, I, was at, I was in my office in Solvang. I had one of the last IKKA banner schools. And I'm sitting in my office and the phone rings. I pick it up and I say, uh, hello, Solvang Kempo. And um, the voice on the other is, is Ed, is Ed Parker. I said, oh, how are you doing? He said, uh, everything's, you know, everything all right? He says, uh, listen, he says, uh, <laughs> if you could touch your toes, I will personally come up there and teach you. He hangs up the phone. <laughs> I said, that was kind of strange. I said, okay, and I, I put the phone down and I go about my business. About a half hour later, the phone rings. Hello, Sylvain Kempo. He says, Tom? Ed Parker. I said, yeah. He says, I changed that. He said, if you can find your toes, I will come up there and teach you personally. And slams a phone down. <laughs> and that's the kind of humor he had. I don't know. I, and I have a feeling he did that to a lot of people. I don't think it was just me. I think he just did that to a lot of people. So. Did you find your toes? Yeah, I, I was just so, you know, and, and I was in good shape back then. I wasn't overweight or anything, but I think he just, you know, I think it was just very funny. <laughs> just you know, and that was right around the time of the tribute, and uh, he was in a very good mood. He, you know, he was. This was a big. This was a big time for him. He was really looking forward to it all. So he was. He was being very funny. You know, about the tribute itself. Uh, you got any uh, anything about the tribute? Well, there is, but it doesn't involve Ed Parker. But the but the one thing that I will never forget is you know his mother Eva came. And uh, with Brother Joe brought her. They arrived. No, we kept sending the limousine up to the house to bring the family down. And they were all in the hotel. I, I had them all booked in the hotel. And uh, so Eva arrived with Brother Joe. And uh, Ed Parker was up in his room. And I met Eva. You know, she was very frail. And comes in with Joe, who's a kind of a mountain of a man. And, and he, Joe had something to do. So he said, take Mama down, to, take her down to the floor. I'll meet you down there. Well, we approached the escalator. And when she saw the escalator, she screamed. She saw moving stairs. I guess she'd never seen an escalator. Living in Hawaii, when she did, and I guess she never saw it at her age. She'd never seen an escalator. So she, she panicked. And Joe said, her son said, no, Mom, it's okay. Just go with him. And she's, ah. And so he, she grabbed onto my arm with a death grip. And we, Joe pushed us on the escalator, on the, on the stairs. 
And as we're approaching the bottom, I'm thinking to myself, I have Ed Parker's mother on the escalator, on this escalator, and if she falls and breaks her hip or anything happens, I'm not, I'm by myself. Joe's not going to take it. It's going to be, what did you do? And Ed Parker's going to say, my mother's hurt? I mean, my whole life passed before me. It, honest to God, I thought, you know, so when we got down to the bottom of the escalator, I just took my foot and just moved her leg, at, butchered at, and ran with her off the stairs, and her legs kind of caught up with her, and I think she was kind of excited about the moving <laughs> stairs. But I said, oh, my God, on the night of the tribute, if Ed Parker's mother is hurt and she's in my care, and so that was, that was my great tribute story. Uh, that was, if that, you know. <laughs> the, the tribute itself uh, was, was great, and, uh, and I want to thank you again uh, for everybody oh. for, for throwing that. That was... Uh, I'm happy to do it. I mean, it was uh, it was a moment, and and you remember how it happened. I talked about it in the journey book. How it it all came together. How he came to me in the internationals the the year before would have been '87, uh, and how he was uh, so tired. and And I remembered back because we used to have used to have the great parties. Not here; they were at the other house. And uh, when we were all so sociable, and Ed Parker was 32 years old, and, and we'd have these great parties, and, and, and I remember him saying, wouldn't it be great if we could go back to that, that time when the beginning, when we were all, you know, because he was worn out, the internationals, everyone was looking for him, and he was just, and that's when Barbara Hale and I, we started talking, I said, what if, what if we had a, you know, a party? Get, get the old guys together, and let's have a party, you know? And, and, um, and of course, the, the minute word got out, people more people wanted to come and more people. Then we moved it to a to like a hotel. They got a little room, and then we moved it there. Then we said, "Well, this isn't a banquet, a small group." You know, we started looking for a big. Then we realized we had a big event because everybody more people. And said, "Well, let's have to do it for everybody then." So that's how it happened. You know, but it 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 started. The thought started from all those great parties that, that you would have, and you were the one that was doing it. Yeah, we had a. Pretty good party house. And, uh, yeah, I don't remember anybody else having, well, Ronnie Bozart, the one time. Yeah. I do remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, want, you want to just tell that one real, real, real quick? <laughs> yeah, bro, you know, so many of the stories I have, uh, I was a kid. I was, I came to Ed Parker when I was 16 years old and in the summer, and, and all the guys I was training with, they were all adults. So I was kind of the, the troublemaker. I was kind of like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't really you know, uh, well-schooled in a lot of things. Anyway, Ronnie Bozart had this party, and he was a man about town, and he had a lot of influential people around him, and they all had the, you know, going on and, and all that, and I show up at the party late. And there was this hors d'oeuvre set up on the thing, but because I was late, some of them were a little tired, and I kind of said, no, I don't know, that one looks, uh, I kind of tasted one, no, I thought, oh, this, these are kind of worn out. And for the, so a woman, shows up next to me, an attractive woman. And she said, well, what do you think? I said, well, I start telling her, I said, well, those are okay over there, but these here, these are gone. They ought to take these off the table. And these, this is, and, I, and turns out it was his wife. She'd made all, she'd made all the, all, all the hors d'oeuvres. And I, and I just, she's, yeah, that, that story. <laughs> Well, it wasn't a Parker story. But no, it wasn't a Parker story. I, I had a, here's, 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 this is. He was is, there, though. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes, he was. They had a, a, a time, you, you know, in the first Santa Monica school, um, we moved over from La Cienega to the Santa Monica school, the one by the freeway. And that school uh, used to be a house. It was a two-story, not a two-story, maybe it was a two-story, and then they knocked the story, the second story out, but it had a loft staircase that went up to a loft, had a bathroom, showers, they put showers in, and an office, and a viewing room, and a large mat area. It was a house. Well, right up the street, there was the phone company, and that's back when they had information operators. They had a bank of information, you'd call in, yes, can I help you, looking for a number. Well, that, their, their shift ended at eight o'clock, and they would come down, they'd walk about a half a block or block to the bus stop, which was right in front of the Santa Monica School. And at 8 o'clock was when the last class ended, because we didn't have an advanced class. And Ed Parker would leave, and then we would be there working out and training, and the girls would show up at the bus stop, and we'd say, invite them in, and we got to know some of them. And well, the guys kind of started doing a joke. At that time, I think it was a two-tipper, maybe a three-tipper. 
And it wasn't long, they say, who's Ed Parker? Because of the big sign and the, Ed Parker's name's all over it. And either Larry Hartshorn or somebody said, well, that's him right there, pointing to me. <laughs> and, oh, you're Ed Parker. And I went along with it. I said, yeah, it's my school. And, uh, yeah, and, oh, you guys do karate. Yeah, well, we, these girls, you know, we had nice little dates, you know. And, and one of them uh, took a liking to me. She came by on her, on her day off before the class closed to watch me work out, I guess. And I'm out there working out. I didn't know she was coming. I was working out, and she walks in, and we're training, working out on the wall, and I see Ed Parker going over to the viewing room, and he says to her, can I help you? And she says, no, I'm just here to see Ed Parker. And he said, well, I'm Ed Parker. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> she says, what? He, she said, he's Ed Parker, and pointed to me out on the mat. And after that, I was, I was kind of a blank after that. It was like he was talking to her and pointing, and I heard her saying she's looking. I don't think she ever saw me again. I think that was the, I think she left. <laughs> he said, what was all that about? I said, I think she misunderstood me. I said, I think I was telling her that I was trying to shop you in the school, and I think she misunderstood, you know. She's confused. She works up at the phone company up there. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right, as a, as a closing story, a finale, I'd like to tell you about Ed Parker's work ethic. I never knew anyone that worked as hard at what he did as Ed Parker, never. I've never known anyone that even came close. The man was, was tireless. If there had been 40 hours in a day, He'd have worked all 40 of them. And if there was 10 days in a week, he'd have been working 10 days a week. He just, I couldn't have done it. I, I've never been able to, to come anywhere close to that. And um, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, because uh, had Parker passed away at a, uh, at a very young age. And um, it could have been, you know, this just, the way he pushed himself. I want to tell you about the, the very first international karate championships. Ed called me up one day and he said, uh, have you got a couple of minutes? And I said, yeah, so what, what's going on? He said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop over and uh, I'm gonna pick you up. Okay. <laughs> I didn't ask why. He's just gonna pick me up, okay. So he shows up and, and he's, he's got Dave Hibbler with him. And uh, I said to Dave, what's going on? He said, I don't know, I was gonna ask you. I said, well, <laughs> you've been with him since the drive over to Pas from Pasadena to Southgate, so uh, you know more than I do. He said, I don't know anything. I said, okay, let's find out together. So we drove, Ed, Ed Parker drove, and Dave and I rode, down to Long Beach. And um, the conversation wasn't anything out of the ordinary. I mean, he still didn't tell us what we were, what we were, where we were going and what we were doing. We got down there and we pulled into uh, one of the public buildings on them, just basically on the beach. And it was the uh, Long Beach Civic Auditorium. The old one, obviously, not the new one today. That's all been torn down. The sports arena was built afterwards, everything. Yeah, but this was the old one. And uh, he had access to, to go inside. And we went inside and we're standing in this huge auditorium with a balcony all the way around it and a great huge floor. And he says, this is the place we're going to hold the first international karate championships. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is going to be big. And, uh, and Dave is like, wow, <laughs> we're both of us. We just, we, 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 it, was, it was incredible. It was great. And um, this was early in the year, probably... January, February, and uh, I was going to be in August. So I thought, oh, great, plenty of lead time, plenty of time to get ready, plenty of time to plan, plenty of time for everything. Yeah, plenty of time. Well, not so much. <laughs> um, let's just fast forward 
to the internationals. I mean, there was a lot of planning. We all worked very hard, very hard, as hard as we knew how. But we didn't know what we were doing. Nobody knew what they were doing. We'd never thrown a international championships before. We'd never thrown any kind of a tournament before. We had all freestyled some. Uh, we knew what that was all about. But, but as far as tournament, um, no. We we had been yeah we had been in, in some tournament. I went to Chicago with with Ed Parker. I was in a tournament there. Uh, other than that, personally, I I didn't. But I was a little older than, than these guys. Yeah, by this time, I was a black belt, uh, 31, 32 years old. And most of these guys that were coming up and really you know the the hard chargers were like 20, 21. So I had 10 years on them, or they had 10 years on me, as far as being that much younger. Anyway. Let's go to the internationals themselves. Now, it's the day before the internationals are going to start. And it was like uh, the whole thing was going to take place in, in one day. We're going to have the eliminations and the finals in the evening. And it's all going to take place that one day. So we we're going through the eliminations and, and it, it, it was chaotic. I mean, it was just absolutely chaotic. There were about at least a couple of thousand more people entered than Ed Parker had, had planned on. So you can imagine, I mean, where do you put these people? How do you have divisions? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, how do you do anything? It was, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. It was just too many people. It was too many people for the amount of judges. It was too many people for the amount of rings. It was too many people, period. And people were knocking each other out left and right. I mean, left and right. You know, in the early days, some of these styles were very, very lacking on actual self-defense. Here you had a grown-up person, 18, 20 years old, whatever, and he could already fight somewhat, and then you taught him sophisticated ways of fighting, but you didn't go real strong on the, on the defensive part of it, blocking, maneuvering, distancing, things of that sort. They weren't, they weren't considered in, in, in most systems. These guys, got, these guys just got out there and banged. They just banged. I mean, they went... Here you get two guys just rushing at each other, throwing punches and kicks. One of them's going to get hit, and they get dropped. I remember standing next to Ed Parker when the tournament doctor walked up, and he said, Mr. Parker, you've got to do something about the control here. He says, I just counted eight knockouts walking across the floor to get here. And we're, 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 we're working on cement floors. People could have got killed. I mean, literally easily killed that day. And, uh, and then Ed made an announcement. There, gentlemen, you're going to have to watch your control. And then judges, and then no more, no more contact. And that lasted about two matches, literally. And then it went right back to what it was. And once having been said, th there was no point repeating it because that's just not what they were used to at that time. I remember late in the day, three of my guys walking up to me and saying, we want to thank you. I said, yeah, you're welcome. For what? And they said, for teaching us how to block. None of our people got hurt at all. But these guys... They haven't the faintest idea what they're doing as far as defense is concerned. They have no defense at all. They just rush it in, hitting the hell out of each other. I said, well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. I said, well, hey, we're fine. You know, we didn't all win, but uh, we never got hurt. Not one of us got hurt. So I felt good about that. All right, now, comes late in the day. They have to clear the floor in order to put in the chairs and the risers, bleachers, under the balconies for the spectators for the evening event, the finals, all the fighting for the championships, right? Okay. <laughs> not okay, because they're not finished with the eliminations. They've still got a lot of eliminations to do and no place to do them. So as they were putting in the chairs and the bleachers, they kept crowding the, spec the, the, the competitors and the spectators for the competitors off. They finally got under the balconies, bad air and no light, and by this time, most of the judges had had it. So you could get what you could get, and you, and you found these guys, and you put them in. And that's how the eliminations got finished, was under the balconies, 
where there were no seats, and it's crowded, tight, and, and finally, somehow, they got done. The chairs got put in. The bleachers got put in. They let the people in. They had forgot to number the chairs in the rows. People that paid for ringside seats didn't get them because the people that got them weren't giving them up. Oh, it would talk about chaos. It was insane, absolutely insane. And the the finals are supposed to start at 7 p.m. <laughs> Come 8 p.m., it was still insanity. People running around trying to find their seats. People arguing with other people. You're in my seat. No, this isn't your seat. Go to hell and so on. You know. And uh, finally, it's about 8:30. We're an hour and a half late. An hour and a half late getting started. And a guy walks up to me and he said, well, that's it. Ed Porker just passed out. I said, I said what? What the hell are you talking about? He said, what? He said, yeah, he fell on his face. Holy. So I, I went down. I found him at ringside. And he looked like death warmed over. He was in no color. In no color at all. I was surprised he was he was cognizant to the degree that he was, and he wasn't real cognizant. He's just sort of in, in limbo. And I said, uh, Ed, we got to get started. And he was like, okay. And I said, uh, look, I said, we'll cut our demo because we're running so late. No, no, don't cut it. He says, uh, you and Dave and Danny and Asano, he says, you, you Dave, have Danny and Asano, he says, you do what I was going to do and, and let the other guys do their stuff. And, and, and people came to see that demo. So I said, Okay, whatever you want. So I went back over to the announcer, and the announcer, when I got there, he says, there's going to be a riot here. And he says, when it starts, he says, there's chairs flying, there's going to be people flying. And he says, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be here when it starts. And I said, well, let's, let's start then. He says, thank God. So I cued the, the band leader. I, I waved at him, and I said, play the national anthem. He said, thank you. Turned to his guys, and he, and he struck up the band, and they played that. Everybody stood. National anthem was over. The announcer, good close friend of mine, Ronnie Bozarth, said in his deep baritone voice, he says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first international karate championships. And the house came down. <laughs> the applause were thundering. I think that got the biggest hand of the night. <laughs> and, and it got started. And from then on, it kind of took a life of its own. It, uh, it, it somehow... I was in charge of the demonstration teams. I, I was running around trying to get the next fighter and the next demonstration team online so that there wouldn't be any delay. When the last match got finished, there'd be a demonstration. When it, that got finished, there'd be a fight. When that got finished, there'd be a demonstration. And so on, and so on, and so on. And we got out of there at minutes before midnight. Because I think if we'd have gone over midnight, uh, Ed Parker would have had to pay for another day. And uh, he could ill afford that because... Uh, Financially, it was a disaster. Even with all those people, it's still he had spent way too much money doing other things and, and things that never had to be done again. And but who knew? The point of the story is the way that Ed Parker worked. He told me afterwards. He said he couldn't sleep for the three days before the tournament. He said I tried. He said I couldn't. I just couldn't sleep. He said I'd go to bed. He stayed at a hotel right near the venue, near the uh, uh, auditorium where it was being held. And, uh, and he said, um, I just couldn't. He said, I, 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 there were so many things that had to be done, I'd just get up and start typing. I'd make me lists, doing this, doing that. And so on the day of the tournament, the man had been up for 70-some hours. I mean... Huh. I'd have given it up long before then. I know I would have. I'd have been on the ground. So when he passed out, he just ran out of gas. He just, he just ran out. Again, I think anybody else would have been down two days earlier. But we got through it. And for the next year, the following year, I don't think Ed Parker spent 10 weekends at home. He was out at his own expense running around the country and Canada 
officiating at any tournament he could find to learn how to throw a better, more efficient tournament. And the second year was even bigger and just almost as chaotic as the first. And it got better, of course, in time. And after a half a dozen years or so, uh, it, was, it was being run like a well-oiled machine. Everything was just, they knew exactly what to do. They did it, and it just went. And for 20 years after that, it was just, it was marvelous. It was incredible. But I got to tell you, there's those first three, actually, they were tough. <laughs> it, was a, it was a real rough weekend. But anybody else wouldn't have made it nearly as far, not nearly as far as Ed Parker did. But that's just the way the man rolled. Hope you've enjoyed these stories. I hope they've given you a little insight to a man that you never had the pleasure or the privilege of knowing the way we did. Thanks for watching.